Andrew, it's so good to get to talk to you, man. Thanks. I well, just appreciate you uh, putting the invite out. I'd love to hear how you got interested in architecture. Um, I don't know about how it started. I mean, it always was, you know, that, and that's the kind of, you know, it's the more of the cheesy stereotype of, you know, playing with Legos and Lincoln Logs and, you know, from far as I can remember, this is always what, what I wanted to do. Um, and it's just something that, you know, that from day one is, uh, I saw the, the kind of potential and the power and, and the interest and stuck with it and, and kind of, uh, just went with it. And, and yeah, it's, it's a, always been a passion of mine and I couldn't see myself doing anything else. And which kind of scared me along the way is like the what ifs and what that didn't work out so much, but no, it's, it's always been innate and it's always kind of something that I've always been curious and, uh, and passionate about since, uh, so I can remember anyways. Was it like the building that drove you or was it the design or the combination of the two or? Um, I think it's a combination. I mean, for me, it was both the art of, uh, the art of making things and, and creating things. And, you know, and that definitely, you know, the birthplace is definitely a Lego and just, you know, everybody has these little blocks and these pieces and what you make of them and, and the art of creating and the art of uh, putting things together and creating something and, and that's tangible that, will influence people's lives and, and, and get to experience it was something that just really, really drew me in, in the whole thing the you know, everything about architecture, the math, the acoustics, lighting, social interactions, all, everything just seemed to me like such an amazing opportunity to be able to wrap everything all into one object. First time we met, I remember how passionate you were and just your facial expression, like how into it, you pulled out a piece of paper and just started like drawing right away. And it was amazing. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess you can't talk normally or write or do any other skills, but you know, we can draw. And that's the only way you can communicate is, you know, is by the art of making and drawing and, and using your hands too much. But it's, uh, it is, yeah, it is definitely innate and it's definitely uh, at my core of things that, especially now that, that I, you know, have the privilege to be able to practice architecture and, and experience it and see it and see how it has impacted people's lives and, and how it impacts my own life and my own excitement. So it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely not a, um, an industry that I find, you know, that, well, it is an industry that I find extremely powerful and uh, exciting. And it's I'm, interested, exciting. I'm interested to talk about some of the changes that you're seeing across residential and business and sort of like restaurants and office space and home office space and acoustics and how all that stuff works. But before we get there, I just want to know, like, did you work somewhere else before you started your own firm or did you always have your own firm? No, I, I, I went up the, you know, I went up the normal ladder of, uh, of working for a lot of different firms. And my, my view was, um, like a sponge is to experience, uh, all types. So, and I definitely suggest that for anybody else that, you know, so I work for really small firms to big international firms and, and just to make sure that, you know, that because I never really intended actually to start a company of my own. I was not, that wasn't, I didn't set out in my life that way. It's kind of evolved um, to finding my place. Um, and, you know, so I work for the small firm where you answer the phone and it's just two people. And then we're for the, you know, 100 person firm where you're working on international projects like the Ottawa Airport and Congress Center. And, and, I, and all of them look back, they're amazing experiences and they're still mentors of mine. And, um, um, but at some point, I think maybe the, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit kind of started bubbling inside me and, and realizing that I had to try this and, and, and go for it. Um, so I literally just kind of, uh, I was working for a well-established firm and had a great boss and he was an amazing mentor. And, but one day I was just like, I, I feel like I got to do this. And, um, and I did with no real role decks of context or like, you know, some, you know, I didn't have political connections or anything. I just literally got a fr couple friends of mine and said, Hey, you, and this is back in the early high tech, uh, boom with my tell, all those guys. And I said, Hey, you have some money, you, you're bored. Uh, let's build a house. So we built, literally built the house on spec. And I thought it was more of the kind of, you build it, they'll come attitude. You know, and I felt that there was a market for cool contemporary infill housing, uh, in Ottawa or in anywhere, but I felt no one was doing it. So if we did it, then, my intention was someone will see it and then like it. And then hopefully that would, um, that would kind of snowball. And that's kind of looking back. I'm like, I can, you know, I'm like, I would, I would even never do it again now, you know, with the financial risk and whatever, it all could have crashed and burned real fast, but uh, it didn't, we got through it. And ever since then, that's all it's been that people saw a piece of architecture we did and then called and then that, you know, that house turned to a, you know, the owner and it was a chef and then we ended up doing a restaurant and then ended up being another house ended up being, 
you know, Toby and other people and then you know, doing stuff for them. So it all kind of, the birthplace was all through houses and, and doing cool work. But. And then you transitioned mostly to like high tech office space almost, right? After residential or in restaurants? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean uh, the thing that I, I would say well, continued all the way through and still today is that our approach to houses was to have, um, my frustration with design is that it was fragmented in all these different kind of categories like acoustics and interiors and landscape and whatever. But for houses, I, it always confused me that why they're separated and why I need to make people to make something special. So when we started with houses, like, no, we're, we're everything, you know, we design it. So if it's your house, that's it, it's us. And we have a structural engineer and we need to keep people to do it. But the design itself should be thought of all the way through, you know, from, from lighting acoustics and, and style and all those things. Um, it all should be, um, you should be really entrenched in it and, and involved in it. Uh, and that kind of, that kind of evolving. So as, you know, as we did um, Matt Carmichael's house, he uh, left and started his own restaurant. So we started doing his restaurant and his description was, I want my restaurant to feel like someplace if it went bankrupt, I could live there, you know? And uh, so it kind of almost went back to being a, a home and um, same with, um, with offices. I, I always looked at them as being such a, such a horrible space to work. Um, and there was no qualities uh, of home, you know, and there was no qualities of things that uh, attract people um, and, and and kind of surround yourself um, at home. Uh, and then when, you know, you know, Toby, I remember we we're designing his house for about three quarters of the way through and he just asked me, he's like, would you ever do an office? And at that point we did, we did nothing. We did not, you know, no corporate work whatsoever. And I said, sure, you know, and just out of whim. And that was a conversation. And, um, but I think he knew that we would take a different approach to how offices are, and um, and, and we did. And um, our first our first office was um, was Shell Fi at One Fifty Algon, and um, and we brought very much so the kind of learning curve of the residential condition to the office space, um, both you know from uh, the quality of space, but also the quality of detailing and uh, and real materials and textures and things that you want to touch and be comforted by and. Um, and that kind of, I think, I think anyways, and that's probably, um, I think seven, eight years ago now, um, I think it kind of reinvented offices then, um, which apparently has to be reinvented again. <laughs> I want to talk to you about that reinvention again, but I also want to get into it. Like there's the theory you bring to it, right? So you design the office and you think about how people are going to use it functionally. And then there's the reality of how they're using What surprised you about the differences between what you thought how space was going to be used and sort of like how it ended up being used. No, that is actually one of the, like, that is one of the more exciting things for me, frankly, is seeing that being in the spaces, uh, the hard part with houses is, you know, you, you, you put all this embodied energy and you design it and it's a very extremely intimate uh, relationship. And then when it's over, you kind of just go and then you never, you know, there's been houses that we've done that we've never seen again and never been in. And so the cool thing about commercial work, restaurants or, or office stuff is, get to go back and back and see it and see how people were using it and what you thought you know would work and and how they use it and surprises and all these kind of fun stuff all percolate and and you learn from that and see how people sit and how they touch and how they work and how they you know where they gravitate light or not light and introverts extroverts and all these different spaces and the permeabilities of all those things um but for us, it was, you know, it's always been consistent that we're, um, we always look at things as the character of the, of the people in the place. So, you know, that, that people could be the, the corporation, uh, uh, that place, you know, could be on a mountain uh, or it could be in a, you know, generic office tower. So it's, it's, it's taking all the factors and kind of uh, understanding them and appreciating them and then coming up, I think, with the best resolve of all of it. Um, that's, and, and I think that's consistent with restaurants or houses or condo towers or wherever. And, and, and for us, what we get a kick out of is questioning it and starting anew all the time, you know. How do you see homes and offices changing? Uh, with maybe it'll be a sustainable push to work from home. How does that change how we live in a space that we work in? And how does it change the requirements of office spaces? How do you reinvent that? How many, uh, how many hours do we have? <laughs> no, uh, you know, I, I know we spoke a couple times uh, and I've been uh, kind of on the last couple of weeks is talking to different um, client, past clients of ours um, and tech and uh, housing and, and restaurants and just trying to, uh, I think, I think as an architect, I think the, what interests us and drives us most is um, 
is just understanding the social norms and how people interact and how people are doing things. And that's, you know, in, in such a bizarre world, this is an extremely exciting time to actually rethink things again. And, it, you know, maybe it takes uh, some, some bad things to, you know, question about what it is and what are we doing uh, and what's important to everybody. Um, but there's definitely going to be huge fundamental shifts. Uh, and I like to think all of them for the positive. Um, just my observations of, of, of talking with people and listening to people. Um, I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of change coming from all levels, um, from office to restaurants, to homes. Uh, and I really do believe fundamentally that it's actually going to go all to the positive as a more sustainable, uh, more walkability. I think walkability is going to be a giant fundamental shift that people appreciate, especially when, you know, if you're in a big city like Toronto where you had hour commute there and back, and now you have zero commute and you went for a jog. So I think all the social um, uh, interactions of how people live, um, they're, they're awakened from, to that. Um, and I, I think architecturally, what we get a kick out of is being able to respond to that. Um, I, don't have a, I don't have like a necessary like um, Office 2.0 solution for everybody, because I don't think, we've never approached that no matter what. Um, but definitely there's gonna be major changes. I don't, I don't find it minor. And I, I'd like to believe there's gonna be a lot of good that comes out of this. And, that's where Linebox is right now. What we're focusing on is all the good that's going to come out and how to respond to it and be a part of it uh, and jump on that right away. Um, I really think it's going to be a hybrid. I think people are going to want to be closer to work. They're going to want to work from home, which will fundamentally shift um, what a home design is, you know, in neither retrofit, uh, you know, existing homes, but definitely for new and, and apartments, especially we're, we're dealing with clients that are doing major apartments that have kind of revamped it now. They said, wait, put on the hold, which is a positive thing, you know, um, not so much as a businessman, but as a, a person that's an architect to be able to re reinvent that, is what if this apartment can uh, house a, a, a proper at-home office with proper acoustics and lighting and comfortable and ergonomics and all those things. So then you can then walk and go to work and maybe work just becomes a touchdown space and for real collaboration and real social action. Because I do believe we're gatherers. I don't, I don't believe in the kind of uh, recluse uh, area. It's cool for now and it's an experience now. Uh, but I do believe human nature you want to gather and you want to collaborate and you need you fundamentally need uh accidental interactions and you know that was the one of the design principles of shopify is that when we first did one for the algon is to scatter execs and scatter people so you're forced to have accidental interactions and accents are good in good cities accidents happen all the time that you run to somebody on the bus and you have a conversation with your best friend and or your exec coming down a new hires coming up and you come up with a new app that you yeah. never knew and you need those accidents um maybe not every day, you know, and maybe it's now a different shift. Um, Doesn't it change of, like the space requirements of office space, so space usage? Yeah, we're, we're doing a, we're, we're jumping right, right away. Uh, and we're using our larger, uh, our larger office clients um, to look at that because it's a, it's a, it, you know, there's the fun social part and there's just the math and analytics that, you know, and how you do that, because there's definitely going to be, I think, uh, the phasing of coming back to offices is definitely going to be a challenge that we need to deal with you. Is a six foot radius stay when you're sitting and how you walk, you know, so then if you're coming into a, a bay, you know, that one little door doesn't work and you want to make sure how you cross. So is it a retrofit thing or is it a reorg thing? Uh, but what we've done, what we looked at high level so far is there's definitely a giant shift on the density of how people sit. So a bay of say 16 people that, that traditionally uh, what we've done with a lot of high tech things is your, your traditional desk has shrunk down to a smaller one because you're not there a lot. That's kind of how we got our density and then we scattered the fun spaces around it, uh, like, you know, lounges and couches and cafeterias. Uh, but uh, overall you had the right wrong numbers. Um, but what I'm, what we're noticing high level now, and what my opinion is, is every place is a workplace now, you know, and I think now that's going to be accepted. I think, before you could only account, you can only account for the traditional office seat. It, it was your total number. So if you had hundred people, employees on one floor, it's only because you had hundred traditional seats, you know, um, when we always used to argue, uh, well, no, you work in a cafeteria, you work at the at Cody's cafe at Shelfify as much as you do in a bay. And I think what's now going to be generally accepted from all levels, from accountants to CFOs, all different people is that every place is a workplace. So, I might lose a lot of seats in that dense bay because you don't want to be, and maybe that happens forever that you don't want to be fundamentally so close to people. Uh, but now we can, that coach is now, yes, that's a bum and seat and, and a little shelf in the hallway next to a whiteboard wall, that's a bum and seat. So the numbers will, will, um, you know, will come up um, and be generally the same. 
as an area, uh, overall area, we're still figuring that out. And I don't, I think there's going to be, I think it's a reduction of area. I think it's gonna, offices can be a bit smaller, but it's not maybe as dramatic as people would like to think because you, you still, you know, you're losing some density on one side and then gaining it on the fund. But what I do, I do believe though, um, is this is going to be a true test of all offices all around the world from tech to lawyers to accountants up your quality of your space and your quality of, of your culture. I mean, if, now that people are at home and they've been tethered, uh, detethered, uh, they like their home and they like the people in their home. Um, so to get them to come back, I want to come back. It's a true reflection, you know, and a lot of, a lot of corporations have a bit of mirror on their face going, oh, whoa, maybe, you know, maybe our space does suck, you know, and maybe our culture isn't strong and maybe we got to fix that. Um, and I think that's the positives that are going to come out of this, that, you know, your workplace needs to be, you know, as comfortable uh, and as uh, uniting and as, you know, all the qualities that you would describe being at home with your family, you, you need to have that in your office. How, how does it shift the family dynamic? Like if you're working at home and you're surrounded by family and all the time, like how does that change how you think about space and privacy or acoustics or any of the, the what are the considerations? I don't even know them. Yeah, no, it's uh it's not, I mean, I live in a house that I designed and uh, it's not working, you know, and uh, so there, there's what I love, we learn from it. Uh, I had to send everybody out for, the, for right now, you know, because I, you know, where I'm trying to zoom, even our day to day work, I'm trying to go around, the, which is kind of fun to go around the house in different spots. And like I said, everything is a work spot now. I'm really yeah. sitting right now on, uh, outside my rooftop is right out there. This is a little kitchenette, you know, and it's all about four feet. And I took the fridge out and moved it. And now I work up here if the sun comes in, you know, so but it was never intended to be a workplace. But if I knew going into designing it, I probably would have changed things differently. What would you have done differently? Well, I, like what I think we just said, the like proper lighting, proper acoustics, and proper privacy, uh, those kind of things need to happen. You know, it's very difficult. It, it's romantic to say, let's all hang out with the family uh, and you're trying to get something done and you're hearing your kids fight and yell and scream at each other. And it's just not, it's just not yeah. It's a, you know, I have a 11 and eight year old. So it's, a, you know, they're gonna, and they were stuck together. So they're not exactly loving each other all the time. And um, so there's gonna be that thing, but how do you retreat and get away? And it's very much based uh, when we, our first office, like I said, with Shopify is that that was one of the big things, a couple, there's a lot of different uh, things, but one was, the, you know, the character of Shopify and who they are and the quality of space uh, and definitely trying to bring home back into the office. But one of the major things that we're trying to accomplish is, is a layering of, um, of different characters from extreme introvert coders to uh, extroverts, you know, in marketing and, 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 and in HR, you know. So, and all the spaces should have their own little home so you can retreat and find your spot. And I think houses now, you know, starting anew will have to have those kind of conditions that you need to, you need to kind of burrow and get away and you need to hang out with your family and, and have dinner and celebrate, you know. Um, so I think that will definitely, it's going to change uh, all, all types for sure. Does that mean bigger houses or does it mean a better use of space? Like is square footage going to increase as a result of this? Or are we just going to start getting rid of certain things that we no longer value? I don't even know what those would be in a house. But. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't fundamentally believe that it necessarily has to increase. I think houses are too big to begin with. I think the, you know, North, North, North American homes are, you know, the, the square foot per person is, I think there's a lot of meat in there to, and fat to cut off. Uh, I, you know, and we've, Linebox has always been extremely diligent, uh, office or, or restaurant or not, is trying to, you know, what can you get in such a smaller space and compacted spaces forces you to be creative, which is, um, you know, we did a 600 square foot house in Toronto and that was, you know, the most interesting house we've done because it, every inch counted and every thing had a multitask. And I think that's what's going to happen. It's not that you need more rooms is everything's got to double down, you know, so the extra bedroom now needs to be a Murphy bed that goes up and becomes your office, you know, and design around the 90% versus the 10%, right? So yes, guests will come once or twice a year at Christmas. Um, yeah. But you can design around that. You don't need to have that room that's just dedicated for that random person that won't show up that often. You can design around all these things. And same with offices. I think it's going to put more pressure because I think there's a lot more waste of space in office than in residential where you got to think about every little room and what it can do and how, you know, how does that room function when maybe the execs are traveling for two weeks, you know, and what does that room do when he's not there? And, and I think there's a lot of fat to be had before we start um, carving into those things. Um, well, I, I guess to work from home, like 
trend will accelerate a little bit, but it also makes that mobility in the office easier, right? If you're not used to having this permanent desk or location, you're used to working from anywhere, you can switch rooms and switch offices fairly easily or work from the couch or the cafeteria or. Yeah, that, that is, uh, that is a, a super interesting question because, you know, uh, I, I'm curious to see how all that's going to pan out, frankly, because I don't know the answer yet. And this is why we keep talking and listening. Um, because we have, you know, prior to this stuff, we have uh, the you know, Deloitte model where they have the, the um, um, what do you call it, the um, oh, what's the workspace, where it's the remote working, where you don't have, not the one more working, I forget the proper word for it, the, uh, I don't come together to talk. So, they, so pretty much you don't have an assigned seating. Um, right. You just come into your office and you wander and go, and Deloitte has that, and they're and they've been using that as a platform for other office spaces and whatever. And it has its place, and it, I find it valid. It was done in the '50s and '60s. The the struggle with that though um, is the human psyche. One wants their little spot, you know. I yeah. want my picture, my family. It's mine, uh, including now. Realizing now, how about cleaning? How about whatever? Are you comfortable sitting at that desk that someone else has sat at? Yeah. Uh, Hoteling, there it comes up now. So the, the premise is you come into your office, you have a, a giant room full of lockers, you put your stuff in there and you wander and you find your, your seat. There's, there, I find human nature is that you want your space uh, and you want, it, it can only be two feet. And that's why I think what's gonna happen now that it doesn't have to be a desk, it could just be a little shelf, that's your shelf. Um, and it can be anywhere. Um, and the other problem, uh, struggle uh, with hoteling is it becomes a popularity contest like, like in um, cafeterias, right? It's very obvious when no one has assigned seating where they seat and who likes each other, you know. And and it, I think that was some of the feedback I got from uh, hoteling was it was very obvious and people run in. And the third part was uh, feedback from that is that people just don't want to think, you know, like we got enough going right. on. Yeah, yeah. I want to come in and think, where am I sitting? My best seat, my best. And then I'm rushing into work because I know the cool seats are over there by the window and wherever, wherever those things are. Um, this is one more thing to add. So um, I. I I definitely see the, the the idea of this kind of like fluid, you know, that you come in to an office and you collaborate and maybe there is no desk at all. Maybe that's what solves that condition that it's just about coming together and having these, you know, cool moments and, and, and collaboration experiences. Um, or you have this little, this little thing where I set my little laptop and I still have my picture of my, my child sitting there, but it's mine. Um, and I, I, I don't know the answer yet, but I, uh, I don't, I mean, I could be 100% wrong, um, I've been wrong before, um, but, but as an architect that, that believes in, in the kind of human spirit, I, I just think that that's not going to fundamentally change, um, though the design of it, yes, 100% will change. What are some of the other considerations for human nature in an office space that we don't tend to think about? Like, I love how you relate that back to the psyche and how people want to have their spot and their space. Are there other things that are, are obvious to you, but not obvious to people who don't think about this all day, every day? Uh, I think people are, I think people are, uh, coming out of this stuff are going to be, um, especially employers, um, are going to be more appreciative and more kind, frankly. Um, that if you're sick or um, you know you got a cold, it's okay. You know, stay home and yeah. and it works. And and when you're in a space, it's I think I think people are actually going to be more more united. And there's going to definitely be that the hangover of keep your distance. And and I don't know how that is that a month, like five years. I don't know exactly how that works. But I think overall, I actually think that it's going to be that people are more kind um, to each other. And and that uh, that word. Um, can be designed around too, like how you sit and how you talk to each other, um, where you sit and, and where you zoom and, and eye to eye and experiences of social interaction. Um, I think that is uh, super interesting to me because we've dealt with it so much and, um, and so much so that, you know, um, when we designed Matt Carmichael's house originally, uh, you know, when I, we first started talking to him, um, him being the, uh, you know, the star chef, and then when I come in and say, okay, we're going to do your kitchen, it made me nervous as hell. So I'm like, I don't even know what, what do you want? What is this, all this equipment, all this kind of stuff? And I think this leads into a little bit what's going on now. So it wasn't about equipment. It's not about your camera. It's not about, it's not about the, you know, your high tech crazy, you know, box thing and whatever. Uh, so for him as a chef, it wasn't about those things. You know, it was, he had normal fridge, normal pots, normal whatever. It was about the experience of eating, you know, and obviously he comes with a confidence that he knows whatever he's going to serve you is wicked awesome. But, um, 
But if you look at Pretoria, uh, what we did is um, it was about the start and the finish of how you eat around the kitchen. So his main thing was that he always wanted to make sure that eye contact was at the same eye, eye level at all times. So you sitting on the back of the island and him cooking, while he's cooking and wandering and, and doing what he's doing, you're having interactions and you're talking with each other. And he was more about the spirit of uh, what it is to eat than it is about the food itself. Um, and he wanted to make sure even as he's plating and whatever, so we did the island so he can pull out the plates while he's still looking at you. Uh, and I think that is where the shift will happen uh, for office spaces. People are going to uh, pay attention more to the human condition than they do about the technology, I think, you know, um, so you can have the, the best camera on the, on the planet with HD and all that kind of stuff. But if you're hunched over, not looking at each other, not interacting, you know, I think fundamentally, including offices we designed, the meeting rooms are horrible, like that a TV is off to the side and it could be the most important person in the world, but he's off to the side or she's off to the side and not a part of it. So how do you design it? So when we do meet, we're looking at each other in the eye and we're having good conversations. You're important. I'm important. It doesn't matter if you're on TV or in real life. And um, that, that it will, will shift and i fundamentally believe that you don't need technology to do that you don't need a forty thousand dollar av room to do it i've seen them and been in them they still sound like crap and they and they still horrible and it, i think it's too much geeking out on the equipment and not about what how you use the equipment um right. and how you surround it you know um that's i think i think that fundamentally should shift uh and and will what are the, some of the things that we can do at home with um light or acoustics to make uh, meaningful improvements that we wouldn't tend to think of. I mean, if this becomes more important, what are the things that we can do today with the stuff we have in our house? And what are the things that in the future we probably want to consider when we're setting up a home office that we're, we're not thinking about? Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, there's you know, it, it really is the basics, but the basics are not so easy. You know? <laughs> um, I mean, you're, you're what are the basics? I don't even know what the basics are. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, if, if uh, the way I, the way I describe it is the, the quality of space, right? So the quality of space is proper lighting, proper acoustics, and proper looks and feel that kind of reflects what you want. I mean, your 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 background is one hundred percent perfect. And residential, ironically enough, residential does it right by accident, you know. So there's more cold molding, you know, on the ceilings. There's baseboards. There's like for you the and libraries in the in the back that adds texture, texture and character. But it's also extremely good for acoustics. So. Uh, residential conditions actually kind of slow they're already there uh, i think there's a lot of little tips like you know lighting and you know it's like all the basically full frontal light as much as you can and you know acoustics all the hard spaces and glass the more glass there is the more reverberates and all those things and and get back to you know i'm very in tune you know a, a bad quality of uh, of acoustics kind of drives me crazy and what i found with uh, with now if the zoom is is the world and whatever is the lack of bass you know, lack of like warmth and sound, right. uh, it goes right to your ear. Um, so I think that's texture to it, right? Yeah, it's just kind of, yeah, it just, it just hurts, you know? Uh, and I, I know for sure, like video is gonna, after all this, video's gonna get way better, acoustics gonna get way better, like as in technology, and these developers are gonna come up with all kinds of cool stuff with limited bandwidths and all that stuff. But for people that are designing their houses and, and trying to set up that, I mean, it's just, making sure that there's as much texture in that room as possible. And um, inherently, if you have real materials like woods and brick, and well, they already come with uh, acoustic qualities with it. So I think it's kind of going back to the basics of just real materials with character-based stuff. And the more soft fabrics, you know, if you're gonna buy a piece of art for your office, buy a fabric-based piece of art, you know, and then it's now acoustic and art. So you can justify the cost uh, of it more. Uh, and it's, you know, Google, and there's so much content now uh, on the internet, you can Google what it is for acoustics, and there's all kinds of little tricks that you can do, and everything from molding, if you pull it off the wall half an inch, the, you know, the sound gets caught behind it, and so there's always neat little tricks that you can do, um, and just to make it, you know, the experience of what we're doing now a little bit better, um, and knowing you're still limited to, you know, what you can do, but I think, I think people will pay a lot more attention to those things, um, and, uh, you know, I think it can work. I was thinking last night, I was going for a walk and I was thinking the next generation of computers are gonna emphasize the camera and the sound quality a lot more than we've probably done in the past. And that'll go a long way, but there's also like the lighting thing is a huge, like a long way towards uh, video quality and, and audio as well, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm just on my laptop right now, but I can't imagine next year you know the newest laptop model doesn't have remarkably better audio and video 
Yeah. Yeah, it's actually kind of shocking. I mean, I'm not, uh, I, I, you know, everything I'm saying might be 100% wrong because I'm not, I'm not educated enough in that world, but I find phone technology, lighting and, and cameras to be far superior than a laptop. And, it, yeah. and you think a laptop, the size of it and the scale of it, you, you should have much more kick-ass camera and lighting, funnel lighting, all those kind of things integrated. And I'm pretty sure that's what everyone's probably developing right now as we speak, um, because that is, you know, there, I mean, there's some non-knowns, but they're 100% known like that, you know, the, the day, you know, of being afraid to Zoom or do video meetings are over. This is now part of uh, your culture. And I think the technology will, will, will go gangbusters for sure. That way you can trust. And now how do you support it behind it? Because no matter what camera I put in this laptop, you still give me the right environment or it, it'll fall apart. Yeah. Uh, and that's why I found with traditional offices, they, they put so much money in traditional boardrooms and it still doesn't work. And the mics are hanging in weird spots. And then every time I go in there and they're rebooting the whatever box they have and all this kind of stuff. And you know, this $10,000 TV and it's timing out. And I, so it's, it's, it's bizarre that the, your laptop, my laptop, and it's still pretty good. We can talk, you know? Yeah. And uh, so now it's, more, I think more about how you sit, where you sit, what level you sit at, how comfortable you are, uh, ergonomics, who's all those things now are more important. Um, uh, I don't think we need to have a, a $10,000, uh, projector, you know, to get the point across and have a conversation. Um, I, I, I mean, hugely biased, but I put that money in the space, not, not the camera. How, how do you, how do you see restaurants changing? Cause I know you've done a lot of restaurants, you've done a lot of famous ones in Ottawa and you talk to chefs all the time and restaurant owners. It, do we come back with this sort of like same thing and maybe smaller restaurants? Is there going to be a move to like cloud kitchens where almost everything is delivery based? And so we, we sort of like get rid of the middle. So we have fast food and we have cloud kitchens and then we have these really fine dining experiential type things, but more limited capacity. Like how, how, do, how do you see this going? Well, I mean, that one, uh, yeah, the restaurant scene is um, a bit more, uh, I would say more personal to me because it's the, you know, uh, we, we have not uh, designed a lot of restaurants and we get to know everybody there in the industry and um, especially, you know, what it's going through now, it's, it's a shame. Like it's, um, it's, there's businesses that have, you know, that are going to lose some money. They're going to wait for some tax breaks and do whatever, but there's the restaurant industry is just, just getting annihilated and um, yeah. it, it it, uh, it's no fun to watch, especially when you know the people are doing it because they're doing it for other reasons, you know? Yeah, it's not about, it's not about your holding company and, uh, and all those things. They, they passionately, I mean, I, I like to think I'm passionate about architecture, but uh, you meet any one of these chefs and, and, and people in the industry that, you know, the amount of hours they work, regardless of what the stuff happened, the hours they work, the energy they put into it, uh, and the belief that they have in what they're doing, um, I think supersedes almost every industry that, I, that I'm aware of. Uh, and that's why we continue to do restaurants because it's our, you know, there's no money to be had for us either, but it's fun and it would mean some right. really cool people. Uh, so to watch it kind of crumble and around us is not no fun um, and it's real. And we, we, we've spoken with all of them and um, there's a big difference between, you know, uh, not, not doing great this quarter to uh, just being done. Um, and that's, that's kind of the reality. Uh, I, you know, and this is definitely denial stuff. I hope it doesn't change at all. Because I think um, restaurants represent uh, the good and how people can come together and collaborate and, and, and experience and be in the same space. Um, and the energy and the talking and that, you know, a proper restaurant, that's what makes a difference to making a cool steak at home. You know, uh, you go there for that whole thing that that is there. I know there, you know, and, and in this world, everybody's when the one thing I've noticed is that everyone's getting being creative, no matter what you are, you know, you're a doctor and how do you, how do you stay safe? You're trying to, you know, deliver packages, you know, you're trying to run a restaurant, everyone's getting creative, which is energizing in the sense that you see if something like, wow, that's how you came to that resolve. Um, right. And seeing, you know, even the government now is saying, Hey, you can, you can allow restaurants to deliver and also bring a bottle of wine, you know, that's okay. You know, maybe the rules were pretty fucked up, you know, and, so, uh, and I hope that the creativity part um, happens through legislation and through legal and through government. So we all kind of like, maybe these things were a bit too extreme one way and maybe we figured out. Uh, definitely in restaurants, I can see people really, I know your city's already doing this, like how you can like have these like blackout, all these kitchens. And um, 
and and having like you know the cool thing with say like El Camino is they have their their restaurant and have a little takeout thing too. So I kind of inherently already had a, a good mix of that happen. But I really don't. I really firmly hope that that, that of all industries that change and transform, I hope that one doesn't. It might have to uh, because of uh, this is what the social norms are. But I like to think that back to everyone being, being kinder and wanting. I think people are going to want to congregate again and want to be together. Um, I could be wrong, but I hope that industry doesn't change. <laughs> but, yeah, there's a good argument to be made that we'll want that more after this in, in some ways, but it might be trusted groups of people instead of um, yeah. strangers, right? Like it might be trusted networks. Yeah, and then maybe how you design the spaces too, right? So that, the you know, it's, you know, the, all the Irish pubs, you know, where they always have like little doors and little things where you go into and you have, you know, um, maybe maybe that helps it. Um, but I just hope that the energy stays high, that, you know, as you enclose spaces and separate people, including offices and everything, um, the challenge of that, uh, the counter challenge is that you're just isolated and, uh, and feel alone. And once you resolve the, you know, the virus spreadings and all that stuff is gone, say a year or two. And, you know, I don't think it's ever gone. I, I think we've all accepted now that uh, we have to prepare for this stuff and, and uh, there's no gone. But um, I, I, I just worry that, you know, in architecture that our spaces respond too strongly. Uh, and then we end up being too isolated everywhere we go. Um, and uh, I think that'd be a shame. Uh, I've never seen, you know, I've never seen the wrong part in, the, in this kind of like more of the, more of the kind of uh, urban planning, looking at my city. Uh, I've never seen uh, so many people on the streets, so many people biking, yeah. so much craziness going on. And I sit on my front porch all the time, always have, uh, always do. Uh, and prior to this stuff, I bet you if 10 people walk by, one one would say hi. Now, everybody, and I, uh, hi, but not like that, like a smile, like a real smile. And it's just, it's in this whole world of, of be a part. And uh, so if, I've never seen so, so opposite, you know, where there people are connecting. Uh, and the right, I find the right percentage of people, like the right amount of people on the sidewalks and right amount of percentage of people on cars is the right formula right now. That's how many cars should be on the road, not that many. And there should be a lot of people on the sidewalks and there should be a lot of people hanging out in parks and you know that's the that's a proper city and if anything right now we're getting to the right percentages you know like the city of toronto the cars on the road right now is the model of cars that should be on your road in a proper designed city that's the way it should be and that park that has 100 people in it instead of 10 that's the amount of people that should be in a park to justify the park and that i think is a healthier city the air is nicer you know it's less pollution this it's actually, if anything, Mother Nature pretty much said like, oh, you're stopping the whole world. Yeah. Maybe you, want, you can't figure it out yourself. I'm going to do it for you. Yeah. Uh, and oh, so I think a lot of- uh, like Three days. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> to shut down, you know, enough. And the, and the earth's breathing right now, you know? Uh, and I, I like to think that people are going to, you know, appreciate a bike ride now and appreciate a good walk and appreciate, a, you know, a high and uh, get to know your neighbor. I know more neighbors now than I've ever had by name, you know? and yeah. Uh, yes, we're seven feet apart, or ten feet apart, or whatever it is, but we wave and we say hi and uh, and we get the little interaction. So I think I think I think there'd be some good that comes out the, of it. The, there's a unique community feeling that I see like percolating, which is now we're feeling a part of something in a way that we you know when you go to work and you come home and you're outside a little bit, but now we're all going through the exact same thing at the exact same time, and not only in our city but in our province and our country and every country around the world. So everybody's got this, we're all going through this thing together. So there's this almost a feeling of like more compassion and I'm a global citizen, like I feel a part of. And so hopefully that makes us uh, kinder and more thoughtful towards each other. And the other inspiring thing about this is for the first time ever, maybe we're all facing the same challenge and the best and the brightest people are, are jumping on this problem and we're all uniting uh, to try to solve it. No, totally. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it, it is, uh, it's absolutely fascinating to watch. How many people from, you know, the rich is the rich, poor is the poor, how many people are just all going as much as they can and pouring every intellectual property, every mind, every brain cell, everything they can do to, you know, to get through all this stuff. And, like I said, the creativity and the creativity it could be through finance and through everything, but just how people are figuring out how to convert factories over to make masks and how it's 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 insanely um, inspiring to see uh, all this stuff all happening all around you and uh, even kids. Like I think I mentioned to you before, is that you know there was a girl down the street that had a birthday and you know it, 
it sucks that you're in this environment. So all the kids got together and decorated their bikes and rode by, you know, like happy birthday on their bikes. And That's so awesome. like, even they, like, even they were forced me creative. Like, how do you say happy birthday with, you know, all the rules and all the stuff. So it's, um, it is pretty cool to see. And I, I wish it wasn't an event that made these things happen, but to be observer of it, um, it's pretty neat to see. And I think architecture, it always has. Like, I mean, architecture has always represented the, the climate and the culture of the time and, and place. Um, you know, from, you know, buildings in Russia to where every country at, the, the architecture responds to that. And I, I, hope, I hope architecture responds to this. And I hope, I hope the government, I hope all levels of everything understands that, you know, buildings and, and planning and subways and, and transit and how we, all this matters and matters more than ever. And we got to really commit to these things. And, and maybe local is pretty good, you know, um, maybe your local maker uh, for your cool little bench is a better way of doing it. Um, yeah. And maybe we got to start looking at um, how we consume and how we waste and, all those things, I think uh, we always knew it was there, but maybe this is kind of like that punch, you know, the punch in the face you needed to spark a, uh, something, something different. Um, but I guess we'll see. Final question before we get off. Uh, what's a project you're working on right now that you're really passionate and excited about and taking a different approach to? Oh, wow. That's a loaded question. I think, uh, uh, well, what are we working on now? I mean, uh, I mean, as a company, which is cool, we're using it. We're using this as like um, as nine box as like uh, uh, who we are. Uh, we're using this time to launch some things that we always wanted to do that we never, you know, we never got around to doing because you're just in the day to day, you know, just hammering things out. Uh, one, we're going to be kind of talking about uh, carbon box for uh, um, as a subsidiary to line box is uh, how we how we look at building uh, either through cross laminated timber, mass mass timber. Um, and our carbon footprint, but a real carbon footprint, not just the mathematical side of things, but uh, how we build, uh, how we do better, and uh, how we can look at um, buildings differently. Um, and definitely leads back to uh, around us, what's, uh, you know, using stuff that's local and uh, just being better designers um, and using better materials and better construction methods. And the other one uh, we're, we're looking at, and we'll hopefully do it soon, which is ironic, the Shelf is our, our biggest client, and we've never had a Shelf Eye store and we design a lot of cool objects. So what we're doing with that one is trying to get people reconnected to the makers. So if it is your bench and this is your maker, um, how they come together and you can watch your bench being made, but it's going to take, it's going to take longer than you think. And it's going to cost a bit more than you think, but it's your bench. And this is the person who makes it and, you know, watch somebody like this carve that wood, That's you know? Cool. Uh, yeah. And, and, and kind of go back, but forward, you know, um, so that, those were, you know, if anything right now, you know, we're pushing forward, but maybe it's a, maybe it's a kind of creative distraction of, that distract you from the, what's happening in the real world and, and on the business side and other thing. And, uh, but no, we're, we're been standing privileged and we don't, we don't have like sideline projects that are the crappy ones that pay the bills. You know, we've, we've always, uh, you know, I've always, when I started line box, I had conditions and, and one of the big ones is that we won't grow for the sake of growing. Um, if we shrink down, we shrink down, but the quality of work will be what it is. And um, cause I've seen too many of these engines where just like you have, you know, the chunky work and then you have this one little thing that we talk about. So we literally still are right now, you know, um, you know, designing hundreds of thousands of square feet for Shopify and, and other tech companies and then still a little restaurant for this cool friend of ours and uh, little chalets and little things. Like we, we love them all, you know, and uh, there's a place, there's a place in our heart for all of them. And ironically enough, the small projects and the, the cool little ones are the ones that actually end up maturing and, and influencing the big products more than, more than anything else for us. Uh, so for us, it's more that as long as we find super cool people uh, try and do something, um, we're in. Uh, and that's kind of in our, our rampage these days of going around to people currently and say, hey, you got, this weird, you got this weird church that you want to figure out what to do, or you got this other weird site on this side of a mountain, or you got something in the lake, you know, let us let us try it out and let us let us be a, a team and uh, so no there's no lack of excitement um for the projects that's for sure um it's just the uh getting past the environment in the day-to-day -day. <laughs> that's awesome where can people find you on the internet find me well i mean uh we, we, we have a decent kind of social media uh connections from pinterest to you know facebook and um and you know, line boxes. Uh, we tried it. We tried to do our best to spread the word. We're, we're gonna, 
start to do more. And that's another thing that's kind of kicked the stuff off too, to talk more about what we're doing. Cause there's a lot of cool things to talk about. And that's why I thank you for, for this. Cause it's, you know, it's insane. Uh, you know, you, your outreach and uh, the amount of cool topics you're covering is uh, it's, it's inspiring. And so we're happy to still even be a, a part of it. So we're, yeah, we're just, well, we've been kind of bashful over the years, frankly, and kind of happy there. But, you know, now I think we're realizing we got to talk more and, and we got to get out more. I think maybe this is that spark that's done that. And um, so we'll try. We'll, uh, we'll do what we can. We're not exactly polished for it, but we'll, uh, we'll give her a shot. <laughs> I hope so, man. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Yeah, no worries, man. Thank you.